if you can't be with the one you love, maybe you love somebody else that you can be with. I mean, (laughs) Hello, hello, and welcome to my channel. I'm Lorena, Lorena Creole, bringing you that spice to sci-fi and pop culture analysis, and of course, keeping it real when it comes to theme parks. So in this video, it's kind of late at night, but I got a chance to see Dune 2 in IMAX in a special fan preview session at one of the well showing more than session at one of the uh, movie theaters here in Orlando paid my own money and this movie I had to come back and make a video review about it so two parts of this video um First part is going to be no spoilers of my impressions of the movie, whether I think you should go see the movie or not, if it's worth your time, and a couple of other observations in a very non-spoiler-like way. Second part will definitely be spoilers, and I will definitely give you a heads up about when my spoiler review is going to start in this particular video because, hey... Whether you want spoilers, whether you don't want spoilers, this is definitely the video uh, the video for you. So before we get started, folks, please do your girl a favor. Please do hit that subscribe button. And when you do, make sure you hit that notification bell so you can be notified when your girl has hot, fresh content for you to enjoy. So with that said, let's get on with the video. So in Dune Part 2, we pick up where Part 1 left off. Paul Atreides, his mom, basically they're learning uh, pretty much how to live among the Fremen. Um, So they're not posers, for lack of a better term. But I do like how much time this film spends on Fremen culture, their social structure, the warrior hierarchy, all of that stuff. Now, I'm a big fan of the David Lynch version of Dune. I'm always going to be. But the Fremen in that film always kind of seemed a little convenient. It definitely required more time to be spent on them. And this film, the way that it was done, is more like the lore explored in um, in the books. Dune was one of the first sci-fi movies that I watched first and then went back to read the books. And you find out so much more information about the rich culture that the Fremens had, how long they've been fighting for freedom, and just kind of how ripe they are in a way for the picking in order to be controlled in, in, in a way. Let's just say with this whole prophecy and the way that they believe in it, yeah, wide open, wide open to, uh, to, be, uh, to be controlled. You also see the relationship develop further between Chani and Paul. Now, You kind of saw a little bit of an inkling of it in the first film, but much more of it is explored in um, this one. And I honestly felt that Timothy Chalamet and Zendaya had much more chemistry in this film than they did in the first, you know, in the first, uh, the first one. So I was very pleased to see that their romance was very believable. And very much, again, in line 
with how I read it um, in the book. And this film took a lot of time setting that relationship up for eventually what would happen at the end of the film. That's a spoiler I'm not going to say in, uh, in this particular part. But let's just say by the end of the film, you feel the emotions for real with what's up, with what's happening and what's, uh, what's going on. You also start to see in this film, and again, it's been a while since I read the books, but I kind of remember this, just how freaking devious the Benny Gesserits uh, are. And Jessica, who in the David Lynch version of the film, seemed to be very much kind of like a ingenue, very um, impressionable, kind of clueless in a way about stuff that was going on. Now, in this one, Jessica is very, very well aware of what's going on, what she wants, and how to make her son do what it is that she wants him to do because she sees his destiny in the prophecy. And dang it, this woman's on a mission. By the way, I really do like the actress who, who plays Jessica as well. I thought, you know, she was really good in part one. Next level in, uh, in part two. The fighting scenes in this film, um, very, very well coordinated. Battle scenes, amazing. The whole thing is such on such a grand scale. It reminds me of the space opera that we used to get with the likes of Star Wars episodes one through six. It's you're wrapped up in the story of what's going on, whether you read the books, or you didn't read the books, you don't feel as if the pace in this is um is like soup is unnecessarily accelerated. This film does a very good job with what a lot of films in Hollywood aren't doing. And I have to thank Denise Villeneuve for this. There is a lot of showing more than telling. And if there is telling, it's a very necessary part of telling. But for the most part, you are just wrapped up in taking in everything that you see uh, that is that is going on in in this and it's it's amazing it's immersive it's almost I want to say like the Lord of the Rings movie movies um, immersion just amazing of course we get to see Shai Halud okay aka the worms of the desert now. Dune all throughout pop culture history, I would say that everybody's going to make a Dune reference when you see those sandworms, um, but they look amazing. Not only do they look amazing, but I love how Shai Halud is gradually revealed, we'll say the scale of how big those, um, those worms are. And I'm telling you, there's in IMAX definitely with the experience when you see, you know, the Fremen riding the sandworms, when you see Shai Halud emerge out of the sand, when you finally see what they look like in all of their glory, it's awesome. I would liken it to um, Godzilla and Godzilla minus one using that atomic breath. That's what it's like when you finally see Shai Halud. Just saying. The musical score, I got to give props to this. The first film, I felt Hans Zimmer just phoned it in because the music was, yeah, the, the vocalization was cool. I did like that. But the rest of it just felt kind of like he had other things to do. This film, not so much. 
dude studied harder for this assignment. The music is just, it is uh, again on an epic scale, like a John Williams type of scale. And I believe that Hans Zimmer is the heir apparent to, uh, to John Williams. The vocalizations, the music fits the mood in every single part of this film. And not only that, if you remember um, the soundtrack from David Lynch's Dune, there seems to be quite a bit of crossover when it comes to the two. I know some people kind of took issue with the musical group Toto doing uh, the soundtrack for David Lynch's Dune. Actually, I liked it. It seemed like Zimmer took some elements from that soundtrack and put it in this and just seamlessly made it uh, made it all work. I highly, no matter of fact, I strongly suggest that you pick up the soundtrack to this film. It is I'm telling you, it's it's great. It's wonderful. So I couldn't believe that this movie was actually close to three hours long. It did not feel like it was three hours. I know, right? Trust me, it didn't because you're so invested in the activity that's going on um, on screen, the performances, especially Austin Butler, who played Elvis in the uh, Baz Luhrmann Elvis movie. Austin Butler as Fade Rotha. Stellar performance. And where you see him in the gladiator ring, that whole part is like black, black and white. When they run Giddy Prime. Interesting choice. I wasn't quite sure if that was a good idea, but the more I looked at it, the more it actually, um, it actually worked and was a very interesting way to kind of break up the film's visual elements putting it in uh in black and in black and white really cool that gladiator scene was banging I'm to the story pacing again done very well between the dialogue between the cinematography which they better get an Oscar for the for the cinematography and again the costume design um as as well perfect. It is literally, again, I haven't read the books in a while, but watching Dune Part 2, I felt like I was remembering things from the book, from uh, from what I saw going on um, on screen. It was just, it was wonderful. Again, it reminds me of going to see films like Lord of the Rings, going to see films like um, the Star Wars films, one through six. Most notably, I'm going to say this kind of reminds me of The Empire Strikes Back and that part from Attack of the Clones for Revenge of the Sith, you know, just wrapped up in the story, the plans within plans that you have going on. Oh, and speaking of plans within plans, very cool to see Baron Harkonnen fly. Granted, not like he did in the David Lynch's Doom, but I like how they went with the fact that dude is so fat. <laughs> he has to have apparatus just to get himself around. So should you see this film? Uh, Non-spoiler, I would say yes. Young kids, I probably would take young kids to see this movie. Lots of violence stuff that's going on. But uh, I would say if they're mature enough to handle it, probably eight years old and, and up, it's it's a good story. There is nothing um, highly sexualized in this film. There's some sexual innuendo, but it's not like it's not like over the top explicit where you gotta explain stuff to, you know, to your kid. At least not a lot of stuff anyway. When they um when they see it, you aren't being preached to. 
You aren't being hit over the head with certain uh, messaging, the universal messaging of trying to avoid your destiny, but it turns out that you cannot avoid your destiny, trying to stay true to who you think you are. Um, other themes such as if you can't be with the one you love, maybe you love somebody else that you can be with. I mean, <laughs> it's a bad way of saying it, but let's just say what happens when you fall in love and then you realize the person that you fell in love with, uh, He's not staying the way that you that you remember him, and basically neither one of you are staying as the people that you um, that you were. Nice to see actual realistic relationship and dynamic between men and between women. So that's something that's sorely missing in films. I was freaking glad to see it. I liked it. I thought it was awesome. And yeah, it's that kind of thing that we've been missing in films, like films that are afraid to portray men as men and women as women, and they both have their own um, their own strengths. Political intrigue, yes, you got that. Love seeing Christopher Walken as uh, Emperor Shaddam. Was it the fifth? Either way, love seeing Christopher Walken. Um, Florence Pugh as a princess, Princess Irulan, I believe. Um, she did a good job as a, as what well. great jobs all around. I really did not see any sucky acting. Um, I'm kind of upset that uh, Jason Momoa is not Gurney Halleck in, um, in this one. <sighs> but that's okay. I got over it because, you know, they had Josh Brolin in there instead. And he, he was all right. But I will say it will throw you off when you see uh, Gurney Halleck in this film portrayed by Josh Brolin instead of Jason Momoa. Okay, that might have been a spoiler. I'm sorry. I'm sorry about that. No, it's not a major spoiler. Mild spoiler, but don't worry. I left the rest of the great parts unspoiled. I would give this movie literally a 9 out of 10. Now, if you're like, well, how come, Lorena, you're not giving it a 10? Well, um, I'm at the point where I don't really like to give 10s. Uh, I like to find something that can be improved upon. With the IMAX presentation that I saw, I noticed some of the scenes were a little blurry, a little grainy. So I don't know if that has something to do with the screen or with the projection equipment. I'm not quite sure, but it was not um, as sharp. So I'm actually gonna go see this film again uh, this weekend coming up to go uh, see it and see if there's see if there's a difference there. As for other things, I would say, huh, there's not a, not a whole lot. There's, again, there's one scene where it's a spoiler, so you're going to have to wait till the spoiler section. A, let's just say, a um, climactic meeting, and it seemed to be very, very rushed. And that's one of probably the only parts in this film that I felt was uh, that I felt was rushed, and I really don't think that they should have uh, that they should have did that. But overall, this film was not a waste of your money. I would say see it twice. I would say see it in the best format you can see it in. Definitely check it out in IMAX. That experience with just the battle scenes, and especially especially when you see the sandworms come out, just just with the sound and the effects and theater that I was in, you know, the floor shaking and everything. Absolutely worth your time. This is a movie that I would say, do not wait until it comes out on streaming. Go see it, experience it in the theater. For real.
definitely worth uh, worth your time. All right, so I'm going to go jump into the spoiler section. So if you guys don't want spoilers, you should probably uh, nope out right about now. So as for spoilers, um, I'm trying to decide which ones that I want to that I want to tell you guys. Um, well, number one spoiler I'll tell you is that uh, Paul Atreides uh, is a Harkonnen. <laughs> yeah, Baron Harkonnen is his grandfather, and it turns out that his mother didn't know that uh Baron Harkonnen was her uh was her father. So yeah, that was a bit again, I hadn't read the books in a long time. That was a <gasps> no freaking way. I did not see that coming. So that was cool spoiler to uh cool spoiler to find out. Okay, so I was talking about this climactic scene where you basically have um Beast Raban. I think he's one of, uh, well, he's basically one of um, Bar Baron Harkonnen's nephews, I think. Either way, you have a scene between him and, of course, a scene between him and Gurney Halleck because he based Gurney, Gurney basically got shipped by this dude and left for dead on Arrakis. Well, he comes back. Paul, helped, you know, he was about to actually go blow up a ship. Turns out he recognizes who he is, and it's Gurney Halleck. So good to see Gurney Halleck back. Not happy to see that it's not Jason Momoa, but it's neither, neither here nor there. Either way, when they finally get to the scene where Gurney Halleck faces off against Beast, it's literally over in like 10 seconds. I just would have thought that it would have been a longer, more drawn out fight because Gurney's got a lot to freaking avenge. So I, I just thought it was over way too quickly and way too convenient, uh, conveniently. You also have the in, I won't say infamous, but the famous uh, scene where Jessica is basically faced with a choice: become the new Reverend Mother for the uh, the Fremen, or basically die. That was pretty much the two choices that she was given. So she decides to uh, become the Reverend Mother uh, once Jessica drinks the water of life, and somehow communes with the reverend uh the old reverend mother all the knowledge of the reverend mothers before her that knowledge becomes hers and apparently no man has been able to do that because you know they would pretty much die that's not a quote unquote woke thing that's actually if i remember correctly in the books so she takes a water of life it turns out that jessica is pregnant she didn't tell anybody. The old Reverend Mother, before she kicks the bucket, is like, what have we done? Well, yeah, basically, Jessica will eventually give birth to what is known as the abomination. And that would be Paul's sister, Alia. I think it's Alia. Yeah, Alia, who is born with all the knowledge of the Reverend, uh, the Reverend Mothers. Now, this was talked about... Uh, let's see. It was talked about briefly in the David Lynch version. However, in this version of the film, it's more insidious. Remember how I said Jessica was more of an ingenue in the previous, uh, in the David Lynch version? This one, Jessica is very, very well aware of the chess pieces that she is moving. And Paul knows that she just keeps pushing him like you are the Kwisatz Haderach pretty much. You are, you know, space Jesus. You need to accept your destiny and do what you need to do. Paul's like, no, I just want to be Paul, Paul of the Fremen. Paul, I want to be part of Feta King. I just want to hang out here with the Fremen because these are my peeps and Chani's my girl. Well, 
throughout the film, Jessica literally has a, I want to say a psychic link, but pretty much a link with Alia, who hasn't been born yet. And because, again, because Jessica drank the water of life, all the knowledge of the Reverend Mothers before, before her, Alia also has it too. And it's like she communicates with her baby. It is just this weird, creepy dynamic that works. So women who have been pregnant will be like, you know, I can tell when the baby's moving around or not really happy with me or moving around. And I think they're happy. They jump and they hear stuff and they're happy. No, Jessica's kind of like, your sister wants to know X, Y, Z. Your sister says you are a bad liar. And Jessica walks around and talks to herself and talks to the baby. And it's freaky, but I love how they set that up. I can't wait to see Alia. She you've read the books, you know what's coming. And speaking of Alia, if, again, if you saw the David Lynch version, right? Alia was the one who killed Baron Harkonnen. In this movie, guess who kills Baron Harkonnen? His grandson. Yes, Paul Atreides winds up killing that dude. I don't think he's going to be He's not gonna be uh he's not gonna be this, but yeah. Yeah, he wants to kill him. And I think that's all the spoilers that I really need to need to give you. Oh <laughs> one more. Let's just say uh cousins fighting. You see Paul and Fade Rotha again, a duel that was shown in the David Lynch version. But in this one, it's less jokey and definitely more of a to the death kind of uh, kind of feel. And it was pretty cool how it all uh, ended, you know, and Fade's dead pretty much. His cousin murked him. And speaking of his cousin, of course, of course, let's talk about uh, let's talk about Paul Trades. All right, so apparently. Um, Men are not supposed to drink the water of life because they drink it and they will die. Well, I'll accept the quiz as hot rock, right? Which is why Jessica wants him to go to the temple, drink the water of life because he is the chosen one. He is a quiz as hot rock and they got stuff to do in the galaxy. So, Eventually, he winds up drinking the water of life and turns out dead. But no, his mother's like, no, he's not dead. He's not dead. You just can't tell his uh, his vital signs. Of course, Chani's freaking out. They're just like, no, you you have to help him. You're important. Jessica's telling Chani, you know, you're you're important. Just, you know, and you're in this prophecy too. And Chani basically tries to cuss her out, and she uses the voice on her. And basically says, you need to help Paul. Love the Bene Gesserit voice. But anyway, she starts crying. And they all, the Fremen say that, you know, crying is a waste of water. Don't, you know, don't waste the water. But Chani has a secret name, which stands for Desert Spring. And apparently in the prophecy, the Desert Spring will... uh bring the Quetzal's hot rock back to life. Not the, um, I'm blanking on exactly what the heck, what the Fremen called them, which is, <laughs> which is a shame. So with the tears of the desert spring, okay, they mix that with the water of life. He takes her tears, literally, puts it in the water of life. They give it to uh to Paul Atreides and boom he's back and Stilgar is like Lisan al which is pretty much you know Messiah but uh Chani is not happy at all that she's been forced to participate in this because she can see this whole just devotion to uh, Paul Atreides being some kind of messiah or savior is not going to end up well. And the Fremen are going to wind up being 
you know, basically being captives again and ruled again. But hey, still guarding the rest of the crew. They're like, nah, it'll be fine. It'll be fine. But anyway, yes. So Chani is part of bringing Paul back to life. He drinks, he's drank the water of life. So now he can see everything, all the possibilities. He can see through time, all of that. And you can tell that he's gone from Paul, I just want to be a Fremen to Paul Atreides, Paul Muad'Dib. No, 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 no. Uso, excuse me. Paul, Uso, Atreides, about to conquer the galaxy. And everyone will fall to me. That switch, when he makes that switch, he is not the same when he wakes up. It's crazy. And I love it. I am all here for it. It reminds me of the transformation of like Anakin Skywalker when he becomes Darth Vader. Anyway, very cool. All right, I think that's enough spoilers. So anyway, go see this movie, nine out of 10, definitely worth your time. Almost three hours where you're just immersed and inner freaking tamed. And again, this is the type of film that Hollywood has not been giving us um, of late. Uh, a couple films have gotten close to it, like uh, like Oppenheimer. Um, but for those of you who are space fantasy, space opera fans, I can definitely say Doom Part Two is like the books come to uh, come to life. Again, I still don't like Doom Part One. It was, eh, it was there. Doom Part Two, awesome, awesome. And I cannot wait for Part Three. They did better make a part, <laughs> the Part Three. Anyway, this is gonna wrap this up. Please let me know in the comments. Have you seen the film early for the fan previews? What did you think about it? And are you going to see this film when it comes out? Definitely, definitely let me know uh, in the comments if you're going to see it. And not only that, if you're excited about going to see it. So folks, if you got some value from this video, please do hit that thumbs up button. Make sure that you're subscribed to my channel and I will see you next time. Bye.